Welcome to Living Well with April and Shelly, where we're raising kids, eating right, spending smart, and living well. Extension Month in Tennessee. Yes, I did and that's so exciting. Yeah, there's a lot of counties that have a lot of events going on, a lot of activities. Um, I know in our county, just due to the pandemic, we're putting a lot of things online, uh, but lots of things going on across the state during the month of Extension, which, you know, every year I think of, when I think of it, March of Extension Month, I always remember the history of Extension. Yes, and you know what, April, we have a special guest this month that can help us remember and pay tribute to our history in Extension. Yes, I'm so excited to have this speaker today. Why don't you introduce her? I would love to introduce her. Dr. Dana Wise is a retired Extension Specialist with the University of Tennessee Extension, and so we're going to let her tell us more about what she's doing in retirement and what she did before retirement, too. That's awesome. <laughs> so. Dr. Wise, it's so great to see you. We haven't seen you in a while because of everything going on, but we're so thankful you traveled to Middle Tennessee to visit with April and I and be on our new show. How's retirement going? Oh, it's great, and it's good, good to see you again. It's just so nice to see you. Uh, retirement is wonderful, and I highly recommend it for everybody, <laughs> and I recommend it early for everybody. So. That's yeah, awesome. I was, uh, before I retired, I was a family economic specialist with UT Extension, and, and I've worked in the areas of uh, bankruptcy, investment, planning for retirement, those kinds of things, helping families just kind of look into their future in a financial context. And spend smart. And spend smart. Right. You know, April and Dana, March is Extension Month, as we know, but it's also Women's History Month. And that's one of the reasons that we invited you here on our show today, Dana, uh, because you are a person that we look up to. Uh, you're a, a woman in Extension that had a wonderful career and one of our mentors. So we want to celebrate that Women's History Month along with UT Extension and TSU Extension Month in Tennessee. And I thought we might start talking about Ellen Swallow Richards. I'm sure y'all heard of her, right? Yes. Oh, wasn't she the founder of Home Economics? Yes, yeah. she was. That's been the first woman to go to MIT. She was the first woman to go to MIT. Um, she it was a female American chemist, and that's very interesting, and that was in the late 1800s. Uh, which was very rare, very rare back then. Um, and she was a sanitizing engineer. So um, she actually, in 1887, she conducted an unprecedented survey. And this led to the first state water quality standards in the nation and the first modern municipal sewage treatment plant. And, um, you know, just going to the restroom or drinking water reminds me of Ellen Swallow Richards, and I'm thankful for her pioneering research. Yes, and you know, a lot of the food quality standards that we have today, that the FDA has, were, were promoted by extension people and by women in home economics, which is what family consumers right. like, so it's then called. So we really have a rich history, the women in, our field do. We do, and that's important to note, isn't it, April, that it was home economics, and now our profession is known as family consumer sciences, and people do get a little confused about, you know, what that is now, because it's different, sounds different, so. Um, Ellen also created the summer celebration conferences in New York, and this was a way to gather women and different professionals uh, to talk about the betterment of home life. And that really is where our professional associations in family consumer sciences or home economics got its start. That's exciting. To have a professional, de a professional association dedicated to your profession is really where the research comes from and how you gain new ideas. Um, from different professionals in the field. Right, and share with each other. Yes. That's always fun when you go to a conference 
it's always fun to get together with different professionals, especially in extension, to see what are you doing in your county. Maybe I want to replicate that in my county. I think people would enjoy that. Yes. So, in 1910, um, Ellen's professional story kind of comes to a close because she retires, but that really is the start of the extension story. And so I thought we would talk about our first home demonstration agent. And, and Dina, I know being the historical person mm -hmm. that you have been in extension, you've um, celebrated extension a lot at our various programs. I know you know a lot about Virginia P. Moore, right? Well, I do know a little about Virginia P. Moore, and uh, the interesting thing, she, she had worked for the state in, uh, as an educator in uh, supervision of education, and especially with rural communities. So somehow she got word of tomato clubs. And you know, this story starts, it almost has to start with the corn clubs. It does. Because back when, Extension's purpose, their hope when they established Extension, was to bring the knowledge created at the land grant universities into the counties so that the farmers, and then they were mostly subsistence farmers. They just tried to feed their families and get through the winter, and there wasn't much left over. But they were developing new ways of farming, fertilizing, you know, doing chemical work, and but of course, when they sent out young people from the universities, the farmers weren't very interested in listening to some young upstart who came <laughs> to tell them how to grow what their crops. What do they crops, have, right? right. <laughs> so they started with just little patches of land that they convinced the farmers to give to their, their kids. So they started the, the kids' clubs, the corn clubs for the boys. And they were like demonstration plots, and they tr they treated those plots of corn uh, with the new methods. And then at the end of the season, they produced like seven times the yield of the regular crops. And that's when the farmers awesome. started listening. <laughs> and then Virginia, so that that set the stage for Virginia Moore to come in with tomato clubs. So she came in and with the girls formed tomato clubs to teach methods of food preservation that they had not had before. They didn't, didn't have pressure canners, didn't understand how, you know, you would preserve food that was a fresh food through, or perishable food through the winter. So that's wow. where she started. Isn't and, that awesome? And she fell in love with that work. She no longer, I mean, she phased out <laughs> of her regular job with the Board of Education in the state and started doing this full time. And went all the way to Knoxville to, yes. to and, and what she did is she became the, like the assistant director for home demonstration work, right? Right. And so she helped to coordinate all of these tomato canning clubs across the state. And one interesting thing about Wilson County is um, our, the first tomato canning club in Wilson County is, was actually located at the old McFarland farm. And we still have that clubhouse is, is still standing today. It's kind of like across the road from Friendship Christian School, and um, one of my FC clubs, the Oakland FC Club, they are still meeting there today. And so we have photos you'll see later on in our video, uh, the first canning club in Wilson County. It's very exciting to still have photos like that. I have to have directions so I can go by and see it. Oh <laughs> yes, that would be fun. Yeah. yeah, it's a really sweet clubhouse, just really homey, and every time I go there, I think about that first canning club and what it must have been like to be the home demonstration agent traveling to the communities and isn't it true uh, some of the first six agents traveled by horse to where they were going to, to deliver a program they did and they would strap their canning equipment their pressure canner onto the horse or sometimes it was a mule because if they were in a mountainous you know terrain they had to have a meal, so they would, wow. you know, strap it to this animal and get on the saddle and go well, off into the wilderness. <laughs> I, I might show up three days later if I went back. <laughs> yeah, because they didn't have, you know, we didn't have smartphones, and I'm.
directionally challenged and I rely too heavily probably on my maps app yeah. and you know they didn't have anything like that back then so. and you would be too sore to move <laughs> <laughs> and they stayed in the communities for for several days I'm assuming weeks maybe months even so. mm -hmm. um, and taught them these new practices that they had learned from the university and then they would move on to another community in the county I'm assuming is how it worked right I think so yeah so what other things that you mentioned canning uh, we mentioned tomato canning clubs but what other things do you think they were teaching um, community members back then well definitely uh, sanitation uh, and uh, going back to what uh, Ellen Richards did with water you know a lot of families didn't understand the importance of separating their sewage and their water and so their water would get contaminated and they would have diseases from that so educating people about their water and then you know later came things like rural electri electrification and helping kids get immunized immunized I can't I may have to talk <laughs> <laughs> we understand <laughs> so there were a lot of things that I think we can take a lot of pride in having a, a part in that history and I even thought during this the last two years of the pandemic you know Shelly and I, I know we're really heavily involved in our face mask project and as we were doing that I just happened to, you know I thought about so many years ago how extinction has kind of led the way on things in the community that are in need that we're in need of like the Spanish flu and you mentioned it a little bit about that earlier and, and just I think that might be think back to that. We were yeah, I, that. I think about, you know, in reading some of my FCE club history, you know, the the way the home demonstration agent almost had to rally the troops, if you will, the, the ladies um, of the home and, okay, everybody needs to plant a victory garden and you need to plant this many rows of green beans and this many rows of whatever and then, you know, document what we did because we're going to send so much to the war or everybody needs to work to make this mattress or whatever they were doing the agent was there almost to rally them up and get them excited about these projects for the betterment of their community and and definitely during that face mask project april i felt like we were rallying everybody to get their sewing yes. machines out and yeah. we'll bring you the fabric and and do it everybody was off. looking for something to do or i was stuck at home yeah and so it provided that outlet for people to have something to do too yeah. and i think that was such an important part of lifting people's spirits because yes. i think more than anything in these rural communities people felt isolated and the women felt isolated well they were isolated. they were and um, so getting them together just to share time with other women i remember my grandmother going with her to home demonstration club meetings you know and that was when she got together with all her friends and they learned a lot but they just enjoyed having other people around to talk to for a while and i think that's one thing that we're missing today is you know when you talk about like your your mother and grandmother in these clubs having that female support system you know when you are raising babies and trying to spend smart and live well it's you need that support especially when you're a woman you need the support of other women and I think we've almost lost a little bit of that now because we rely so heavily on technology getting together in groups of people really has value to your family and your overall mental health and well-being too wow. mm -hmm. and I think we we, we were on to something during that time the community gatherings and how much people enjoyed them and and how much um, they felt it made it built community mm -hmm. you know right. in the community in the community like the mattress makings when you know they would mm -hmm. bring in uh, oh I have a fun story okay. about the mattresses the, uh, when back this was before the Second World War uh, there was a cotton surplus and the US government decided that rural people needed mattresses they were mostly sleeping on uh, mattresses stuffed with corn shucks or something like that. How so, uncomfortable. Yeah, right? Right, very comfortable. <laughs> so so they, they gave 50 pounds of cotton to each family. And uh, the extension agent brought out the cotton ticking and they all taught them how to make these mattresses and everybody made a mattress and took home with them. 
Well, at my mom's house, there is still a mattress under the bed that they made wow. when they when the extension agent did that. And we pull it out when we need an extra bed, and the, the kids sleep on the pallet, you know. So, so my husband was pulling it out the other night. He said, "This thing is heavy. I wonder how much it, it weighs." And I said, "It weighs 50 pounds." <laughs> <laughs> But what a good story, and yeah. to have that still, you know, what that's exciting. I have a quilt um, in our office that our SC clubs um, made for when they turned 100 years, their, their county organization, and one of the clubs, that was their big project, they remembered, that, and it has a, a mattress that looked yeah. like a small little replica that doesn't right. weigh 50 pounds, but um, it's always a good reminder and a talking point when people come in our office, like, why is there a mattress on this quilt square? Well, let me tell you why there's a mattress. So that's a really neat story. Mm -hmm. Well, speaking of neat stories, April, do you have a fun story from Extension? Well, I've been working 30 years, but I can just, uh, I was thinking earlier, I can remember when I started, now, now there'll be stories about this, like we're telling stories from years ago, 100 years ago, I'll be, people will be telling a story about me. But when I started, there was only, I think, I can't remember if it was when I started, there was no computers, but at some point, not too long after I started, 1991, our secretary got a computer, and that was the only computer in the office, and each of us finally got emails, and we would each go check our email on the, the secretary's desk, and so now we all have computers, and all the technology yeah. that we've got now, it's really changed a lot. That's really changed a lot. Speaking of technology, Jean Motlow Tyree was one of our home demonstration agents in Wilson County. And um, when we celebrated FC's 100th birthday in Wilson County, she came to our big event and she told stories for maybe 30, 45 minutes. And it was, there's so much, and I wish I could have, I should have recorded it, but I didn't. But one story that I remember, and it was so funny the way she told it, um, all of the agents had received microwaves when they came out. And she said that, the, I guess the training that they had was how to cook a turkey, like a small turkey in the microwave. And she said, I toted that microwave all over Wilson County. And she went to Cumberland University and taught the college students how to cook a full course dinner out of the microwave. And she said she was, all the agents were so proud of having this microwave because nobody had them really in their homes yet. And they, it was so cutting edge to, to be able to have one and then demonstrate how to use it and then eat a meal from the microwave. I just think that's so cool, you know, to think about. And of course, I've never not had a microwave, so, you know. <laughs> Dina, do you have any stories? Of, of um, no, the microwave story made me think a little bit about cell phones, you know, like, yeah. and because uh, I was working in Texas when cell phones became started becoming popular, and uh, I would see these signs and, and I didn't even know what it was advertising. <laughs> now I know that we're advertising for your <laughs> service. But, um, but they gave us cell phones, and they were these big, huge things in bags that looked like a sort of a real telephone, but right. it was square, you know, like old telephones used to look like, and we carried them around in our cars. But we were the only people in the county who had cell phones. Uh -huh. So we got them so they could, you know, be efficient in sending us from one place to the other. Wow. <laughs> yeah. If they needed to let us know where we, somebody had a question or a home visit that we needed. So that's so awesome. It always yeah. and you know we were, it was fun to yeah. get new technology and get to show everybody how it was used. Well, and that you know brings us to another point in extension. The community is our classroom, so it is it is very important to stay you know, informed of new technology and being able to be reached while you're out of the office. Because our, our job as extension agent is not to be in the office, but to be out with the people. So, so they were ahead of their time too in Texas. <laughs> <laughs> um, one other question that I have, I was thinking about was, um, for me, there's a lot of women in my profession that have really meant a lot to me and I could name a whole parcel of people in Tennessee that are special. Dina, you're here today and you're one of those people but 
I want us to think about maybe who is the one female in our profession that's really influenced us maybe to get into extension or family consumer sciences as a, as a whole. And, and I'll share mine first if y'all are okay with that. But Miss Becky Bug was um, one of my 4-H agents in Cannon County. And uh, she was the FCS 4-H agent. So um, we have some agents that have a split position. So she did family consumer science work and also 4-H work. And so she did sewing classes and cooking classes. And as I got older, she y'all stole her over here in DeKalb mm -hmm. County. So she left us. but. As I got older and she moved through her career, I was able to work with her more through the 4-H All-Star program. And, and she just always had just a kind, good spirit about her and just really made me want to learn more about extension. And she's probably, if I had to think about it, the person who kind of guided me into the path of extension, family consumer sciences. I probably always wanted to do 4-H, um, but choosing family consumer sciences was, um, because of Miss Becky. Yeah, Becky somebody? was really sweet. She started about the same time I did. Um, I guess I would go, well, I, obviously Dina, Dina, yeah. you're one of my <laughs> favorite people and, and we really do miss you. Um, but um, I, I guess sort of the same, a similar way is my 4-H agent growing up. I grew up in East Tennessee in Claiborne County and my 4-H agent was uh, Connie Haskell. You may not I have knew that, that, but she used to be the uh, the FCS or the Home Economics agent at that time, and I was involved in 4-H, and uh, just uh, nobody in my family had ever been to college, and I just saw that there was better opportunities if I went to college, and she encouraged me, and so I guess that's how I got my start as well. That's probably who I would say I would look up to the most. That's awesome. What about you, Dana? Well, I, I guess I have to say that my mentor for, for getting into what was then home economics was my high school home ec teacher, and her name was Catherine Lumpkin. She was a neighbor, and I loved the subject matter. I knew that, that I enjoyed doing what home economists do. And then um, my uh, extension agent was Billy Cotney. She came into the schools, and I thought that was such a fun hour that we had in 4-H. Yeah. Uh, so it was a nice break from school, and I thought it would be so fun to do her job. So I guess they were the ones that got me thinking about it. But others since then, there have been so many other women and, I, and so many other agents that I've admired. I've worked in four states oh, wow. in extension, so I've known a lot of different programs and people. and. I've always said that that was the best thing about my job, the wonderful co-workers and families yes. that I work with. It's been a real blessing to I me. love that. And that's a good point too, you know, talking about why family consumer sciences is so important. You know, I'm able to apply the things that I learn in my training to teach others to my own life. And, you know, I may not need to or be able to implement the programs and in child development everywhere I go, but I have children. And so I'm always going to in services to be able to learn for myself. So that, I love that about our profession is that it's, you know, it's really important. And even though it may not apply to you now, it may someday, I know I'm, yes. I just recently started teaching the matter of balance class. And a few years ago, I would have thought, I don't know that I belong in that class, but I'm starting to get older myself. Because it's a fall prevention yeah, program. It's a fall prevention program. Yeah, and I'm actually starting that um, soon as well at Market Street Church of Christ. I'm very excited You're about that love class. It. It's yes. a great class. It's, it's a, a lot of people need it too. Yeah, and I tell people about, you know, when I was pregnant with Ripley, I fell. And of course, that's terrifying when you're pregnant. But I was fine. She was fine. Everybody's fine. But then when Davis was about two, I slipped on my parents' deck and kind of contorted my body so that he would fall on top of me and I wouldn't fall on top of him. So in the training, even though, you know, I'm not super old yet, I, it, it spoke to me. Like, okay, they, yes, these are very good tips. For anybody. anybody, you don't have to be elderly to need this class. Right. So, yeah. and we want to talk about how much I need. <laughs> <laughs> well, you don't want to have to drive two hours. <laughs> no. 
<laughs> I didn't want to find you one of these tips. <laughs> it really is a good practice for anybody, though, yeah. like you said, because, I mean, you know, everybody falls. And there's always hazards. So. Yeah, and it's, they said that it's the um, one of the number one causes of injury, and it's 100% preventable. Yes. As long as you know, you know, you just need to know some exactly. things to do with, to change your environment. Mm -hmm. How would you say, Dina, that Extension has changed through the years since you first became an agent until now? What are the biggest changes you've seen or unique changes? Or well, Certainly technology, you know, the, the computers. Uh, you said you came in just as computers were coming in, but I came in when we had mimeograph machines that we wrote oh, newsletters on, and then, <laughs> and then we mailed everything out, and now we email everything out. We've gotten so much incredibly more productive over the years so that yeah. our capacity to reach people has just multiplied. Mm -hmm. But I think on the other side of that, maybe we've gotten a little less personal so that we are beginning to, especially during the pandemic, well, we had to, but you had yeah. to. Mm -hmm. I was retired. But <laughs> <laughs> but you watched us. I watched you. watched us. <laughs> and you did great. Thank you. Like that transition. <laughs> but, um, but I... Toward the end of my career, I was missing the personal contact. I wasn't having it as much. We were reliant on, on technology to get word out. And, uh, and so I began to miss that. So mm -hmm. that's one thing. But, and then I think our subject matter has become more varied. Mm -hmm. And uh, so we, there's so many things we, you know, that extension you, not me now, <laughs> you need to, to stay up on all the time. Yes. So mm -hmm. you just have to read voraciously. <laughs> you do. You, you, you really do. And yeah. like I had a call this morning of, for food preservation and, you know, there's lots of questions and one of them, you know, I couldn't answer so I have to get back with her on that and that's okay. But we have to constantly stay current and updated on um, new trends and new research coming out. and. But I do think you're right, Dina, about the personal connection. You know, it's so easy to text message or to find something online and email. That personal connection is something that, you know, technology cannot replace. Right. And that's Building so the community, like yes. we were talking about before, mm -hmm. is, is it's such a healthy thing. It is. And I don't, I don't want to see Extension get away from no, that. No, no. And I think that is one thing that Extension Month um, is we're able to kind of shine the light on Extension and use March as a time to try to get the word out because for so long we we know the term Extension's best kept secret. We don't want to be a secret. We want our clients to know about us and come to us and us go to them and them learn about what it is that we do. We're more than the 4-H office. That, in so many ways, that's a way we can reach people is through 4-H, but letting them also know about our other programs in family consumer science, agriculture, community economic development. We have a wealth of programs and activities that people can be involved in. And I think a lot of people, just even around the country, don't realize that there isn't a county extension office in every county in the country, mm -hmm. not just Tennessee. Yeah. And that the research, is, that the excerpts and information is research-based. That's mm -hmm. important. It's, I was actually listening to a podcast on the way uh, down here this morning, and it was about knowing what is factual and what is not factual. And it's so hard nowadays to know if you're on some type of social media outlet, if you're watching the news, whatever it may be, is this real or is this not real? Where did they get their research from? Who did this come from? And just because an expert is saying it, what type of expert is this person? Are they an expert in this field? All of these questions, you know, and anyway, what this expert had said, she was actually an expert on social media. She said that most people, when they are scrolling, they don't scroll with the intent of how do I feel about this? Do I believe this? Where is this information coming from? They scroll with more of emotions. And they may share it, but they may not even agree with it. And I thought that was very interesting information. So I think that's something that people need to realize is that when we bring you information, it's research-based. Some of it is evidence-based. And, you know, 
it's good information, solid information, and you can believe it and trust it. Well, Dana, thank you so much for coming out today. We've really enjoyed catching up with you and seeing you here face to face and reliving some extension memories. Oh, thank you, Shelly and April for inviting me. I had so much fun. Until next time, we're raising kids, eating right, spending smart, and living, living well. well.